Okay, good morning, everybody. <laughs> good morning, everybody. There we go. Uh, we welcome you to the Tarpon Springs campus of St. Petersburg College for our partners in Zika presentation, and, and uh, we're proud that you're here. Uh, we have a wonderful panel this morning uh, to talk about uh, Zika and prevention. Today's objective, thank you. Today's objective is pretty simple. We want to provide citizens and the community partners important information about this countywide issue as well as alleviate concerns that you might have with the Zika virus. Pinellas County has established a strategic plan, and one of the keystones and cornerstones of that strategic plan is to ensure public health, safety, and welfare. And today we're going to be talking about the Zika virus and uh, what that really means, give you a little bit of education about it, and also share with you what the county is doing to educate and prevent. So this morning, uh, before we uh, get too deep into it, I'd like to thank our partners, uh, St. Petersburg College, our Tarpon Springs campus, the University of South Florida College of Public Health, the Florida Department of Health in Pinellas County, and our Pinellas County Mosquito Control and our County Administration. I'd also like to recognize some special guests we have in the audience. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize my colleague, Commissioner Dave Eggers. We have uh, State Representative Larry Ahern. Representing our United States Senators, we have Shara Anderson from Senator Nelson's office and Ashley Cook from Senator Rubio's office. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, if you'd like to see uh, either of our two federal representatives after the meeting this morning, uh, they'll tell you some more information about the Zika funding bill, which is uh, potentially before a Senate vote this afternoon, and uh, can give you some more details about that. Uh, I'd like to bring up the provost of the Tarpon Springs campus, St. Petersburg College, uh, Dr. Marvin Bright, for welcome remarks. Good morning. Good morning. On behalf of St. Petersburg College's president, Dr. Bill Law, the Board of Trustees, I'd like to welcome Charlie, the Pinellas County Board of Commissioners, our distinguished guests, and all the individuals in the room. So welcome to the campus, and I'm sure the event will be very informative and knowledgeable for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bright. We appreciate the uh, hospitality. If you do have a question from the public uh, that you'd like for one of our panelists, please see one of our public information officers. Uh, they have yellow cards for you to fill out uh, and, and to be submitted. Uh, I'm, today I'm going to begin by uh, introducing our panelists. Uh, we have Dr. Thomas Unash, who is a chair and distinguished health professor at the University of South Florida College of Public Health Department of Global Health. Dr. Unash has been recognized as one of the leading experts on vector-borne diseases, which are those transmitted from an infected individual to another by animals such as mosquitoes. His laboratory concentrates on research areas that have direct impact on disease control and elimination programs targeting vector-borne diseases worldwide. Dr. Unash also specializes in molecular biology, vector biology, and ecology, as well as tropical public health. He holds a doctorate from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and a postdoctoral degree from Harvard University. We also have Dr. Yuli Cho, director of the Florida Department of Health in Pinellas County. Dr. Cho is board certified in both internal medicine and infectious diseases. He currently serves as a co-chair of the Health and Medical Committee for the eight county Tampa Bay Regional Domestic Security Task Force as well as vice chair of the Health and Medical Coalition. He also serves as the chair of the statewide Communicable Disease Program Council and has served on the state medical advisory group for Ebola. Dr. Cho is a graduate of the University of Florida where he earned a Bachelor of Science degree in microbiology and holds a doctorate in osteopathic medicine from Nova Southeastern. Brian Lawton is the program coordinator of the Mosquito Control and Vegetation Management Division in Pinellas County. Brian's worked for Pinellas County for 19 years. He's a Tier 1 State Certified Director for Pinellas County Mosquito Control District. He provides development and implementation of the county's mosquito control plan to ensure public health, safety, and welfare in our community. During his time at Mosquito Control, he's also managed responses for St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile, and now Zika. Pinellas County Mosquito Control serves nearly 1 million residents and works closely with our 24 municipalities and the Florida Department of Health in Pinellas County on prevention and mosquito-borne illnesses. John Bennett is our Pinellas County Assistant County Administrator for Public uh, Health, Safety, and Welfare. John works closely with county partners to cultivate communication and collaboration. He oversees animal services, marketing and communications, emergency management, human services, safety and emergency services. John served more than 30 years in law enforcement with the City of Tampa Police Department, retiring as the Assistant Chief of Police in 2009. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Criminology from St. Leo, a Master of Arts degree in Homeland Security from the Naval Postgraduate School, and has dual postgraduate certificates from the University of Notre Dame, Mendoza College of Business and Executive in, uh, Integral Leadership and Vital Leadership Advantage. So you can see we have a very distinguished panel this morning for you. Uh, but let's start with some of the basics. Dr. Unash, we'll start with you this morning. 
Can you just give us an overview of what is Zika? Uh, Zika is uh, one of the so-called arboviruses or arthropod, arthropod borne viruses uh, that uh, exist around the world. Uh, it's a, a virus that's a member of a family known as the flaviviruses. Uh, there's about 23 or 25 different flaviviruses that have been identified uh, worldwide, a large percentage of which are actually um, pathogens for humans, pathogenic in, uh, for humans. Uh, this includes uh, viruses like West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, two viruses which uh, Florida is relatively familiar with, uh, and also uh, the yellow fever virus, uh, which is probably one of the uh, largest historical killers of um, uh, by arthropod borne viruses of human beings uh, worldwide uh, across history. Um, the virus was originally isolated in 1947 in a just a broad casting of, of virus uh, isolations in uh, a <clears throat> forest in preserve in Uganda, known as the Zika Forest or Zika Forest Preserve, which is where its name had come from. Uh, it was known to sporadically cause uh, cases, pretty much asymptomatic cases of uh, in, uh, pathogens uh, disease in that area, but most of it was very mild self-limiting disease with no real... Um, as far as anyone could tell, uh, lasting consequences. Uh, from there, uh, it was spread out into Madagascar and into the uh, islands off the uh, east coast of Africa in uh, around the mid-2000s, uh, and it made a jump from there into Polynesia, where it caused a huge epidemic in Polynesia through Tahiti and many of the other islands in Polynesia. Um, estimates are over 80 percent of the uh, population were if infected at that point in time. Um, Again, uh, though not very much in the way of uh, any sort of disease associated with the infection in the Polynesian outbreak. Um, then from there, it jumped to uh, Brazil. Um, about three years ago, 2013, 2014, um, probably as a result of a, a soccer match, a friendly soccer match before the World Cup between uh, Brazilians in uh, a city in North Eastern Brazil, Recife, and uh, Tahitian uh, Polynesian team. Polynesians lost seven to four, uh, but they got their revenge by introducing Zika into uh, Brazil. <laughs> and Zika there actually exploded at that point, um, causing hundreds of thousands of cases. And that's where we first started to see documented cases of these birth defects, this microcephaly associated with the infection. It's believed that when it made the jump from Polynesia to Brazil, at some point along the way, there was a mutation in the virus that actually caused it to go pathogenic. Of course, uh, from Brazil, it managed to spread from there all throughout the Caribbean, where it's been raging since about 2015. Uh, tens of thousands of cases now in the islands uh, throughout the Caribbean, including Puerto Rico. And of course, from there, we've had a lot of pressure here in the state of Florida uh, with a lot of imported cases, I think close to 800 or 900 imported cases uh, of uh, Zika virus over the past um, eight months or nine months or so, uh, resulting eventually in uh, local transmission of the virus, uh, primarily in the Miami Beach region uh, in Miami and in uh, the Wynwood neighborhood, which was just declared uh, cleaned yesterday, um, but also uh, sporadic transmission, including one case here in Pinellas County. What can you tell us about this particular mosquito that is the transmitter? What's different about maybe the mosquitoes that you might have seen before in Pinellas County or in our region? Uh, well, the, the mosquito that we believe is primarily transmitting the virus here is Aedes aegypti. Aedes aegypti is probably one of the largest killers of uh, people worldwide. It's the primary vector also of um, yellow fever virus. Uh, it has been here. Uh, it's an introduced species here in Florida and in the Caribbean, but it's been here longer than any of us have been here. Uh, it's actually been thought to have been introduced uh, by uh, rain barrels and water barrels, barrels carried by the second voyage of Columbus, uh, which would have been about 1494, I guess. Uh, it's spread rapidly through here. It's a mosquito that's very closely associated with human beings. It really uh, bites almost exclusively and feeds almost exclusively on human beings. It's a daytime biter, which is very different from most of our mosquitoes, uh, which tend to bite at dusk and at dawn. Anybody who actually goes outside knows that you get attacked by mosquitoes in the dawn and in the dusk. But these guys actually are very aggressive, and they'll bite during the day. 
Um, it's also uh, the vector for a dengue virus, which is probably is the most important uh, arthropod-borne virus that's being uh, circulated. Again, another flavivirus around the world with hundreds of thousands of cases a year, probably millions of cases a year. Uh, the mosquito really likes to live in close uh, habitation with humans, likes to breed in our small little containers that we put out, um, discarded coffee cups, um, um, flower pots, the little uh, reservoirs we use under flower pots, bromeliads are also a very nice thing for it to breed in. And um, it tends to live inside your houses, if it can get inside the houses. Here in Florida, we're lucky that we, we live inside screened houses, and in most of the places where we live, we don't have large populations. But in places like Puerto Rico, or the Caribbean islands, or even for that case, uh, in that event uh, down in um, Key West, Florida, in the old uh, town Key West, where people live in a much more open environment, you tend to get these mosquitoes living directly and breeding directly within the houses. Um, so it's a unique species in that, that respect. And, and it, tell us a little bit about the life cycle uh, of the mosquito. And we've heard uh, uh, now people praying for a, for a very cold winter. Uh, what, what's the reality of the temperatures that you'd actually need to get to to uh, have an impact? The cold, when, uh, probably you wouldn't need to get very cold uh, temperatures, probably down in the, uh, the high 30s or 40s at night and up and around in the 50s or 60s during the day will really slow the breeding process of the mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are all cold-blooded, of course, um, so their metabolism and their breeding cycle really um, depends upon the temperature. Um, so uh, the higher the temperature, the faster that they go from eggs to larva to pupa to adults, uh, the faster they digest blood meals, uh, which means the faster that they go back and they will transmit diseases again. Um, the temperature effect slows all of that down. And um, if you're a female mosquito uh, on this planet, life is nasty, brutish, and short. Um, most of the mosquitoes are prey species. They get picked off by frogs and birds and lizards. And the chances that you're going to survive from one day to another uh, are estimated to be around 90%. That sounds a lot, but if you actually extrapolate that out over a two-week period, which is the time that it would take to complete a life cycle when the temperatures are relatively cold, two to three weeks, that means survival overall is less than 5%. So cold weather is really good for helping us control mosquitoes. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Cho, can you uh, just start telling us a little bit about Zika, uh, the, and the effects, uh, the transmission, and, and the seriousness of the Zika virus? So um, as Dr. Yunash mentioned, uh, the majority of uh, Zika transmission is via mosquito bites. So I think that's, uh, that's key. Um, but you can also get Zika uh, through sexual transmission. Uh, studies have shown that the virus can actually live in bodily fluids for long periods of time. That's why the CDC, for example, um, recommends um, for males who had uh, been infected with Zika that they refrain from unprotected sex for a period of six months. So that's an important fact. Um, other than um, uh, other ways of transmission includes um, through uh, blood transfusions, um, as well as uh, transferring the infection from a b mother to an unborn child. Um, I, I think you may have seen that report out of Utah. It was an unusual case. Um, this person uh, um, transferred the virus uh, to their caregiver. Uh, it was. Uh, it has some scientists baffled. The person had uh, extremely high levels of viruses in their blood, and so they're exploring whether it could be in these rare and abnormal circumstances through contact, uh, through contact transmission. In terms of um, the seriousness, again, as uh, Dr. Um, uh, Yunash alluded to, it's generally a mild disease. Only one in five people show symptoms, and when they do sh uh, uh, show symptoms, it includes fevers, uh, rash, uh, joint pain, as well as uh, redness in the eyes. And generally, the symptoms last about seven days, and for the most part, that's, well, that's what it is. In fact, it's, it's probably even more mild uh, than other mosquito-borne illnesses, such as chikungunya or dengue. And obviously, the bigger concern is, is the possible association, the association with Zika uh, and birth defects. Can you talk a little bit about that, the impact on, a potential impact on a pregnant woman uh, if she contracts? Okay. Uh, so uh, Zika uh, has been associated with birth defects, inclu including microcephaly, uh, including uh, uh, problems with the eyes and the ears, among other things. Um, they, they, the thought is that it's mo most seriously impacted if they're infected uh, within the first or second trimesters. Um, 
In terms of the, the actual risk and the numbers, I think with uh, Zika, as with any other emerging infectious diseases, we're learning more and more about it each day. Um, I've seen studies, really preliminary numbers, uh, ranging from um, 1 to 13 percent risk if someone's infected with uh, Zika during pregnancy, developing birth defects, to less than 1 percent. So I, I, think the, uh, I think the study's still ongoing, and I think we still need to learn more about the virus. Can you tell us, there's been a lot of talk about the, the one non-travel case that we have in yeah. Pinellas County. Talk a little bit about that case and then the, your department's investigation process after that. Okay. So uh, as you're aware, there is a confirmed uh, case of Zika in a person that hasn't traveled to areas of ongoing outbreak, including um, the ongoing outbreak that's ongoing now in the Caribbean, uh, Central and South America. Um, uh, generally, one, a single case doesn't uh, mean that there's an active transmission. and. Um, uh, and, and I know I get this question from time to time, is the location. We don't generally divulge personal information or the location un unless there is that evidence of active transmission. Now, uh, now a little insight on our investigation uh, in, in, of this particular um, individual. We, we did the testing, and what we do uh, initially with an epidemiologic investigation, we, uh, we target people that they've spent um, uh, the most time with, including family members, coworkers. Um, uh, so fortunately, those have been negative. We do other testings, uh, too. We uh, test other individuals in the area uh, of where they reside. Um, and in fact, and Brian, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we've also sent mosquitoes out. And all of these tests have been negative. To me, that, that's reassuring. And again, an evidence that there is no active transmission and therefore no, pub no uh, issue with uh, no public health threat at this time. OK. You did mention uh, uh, blood transfusion. Uh, has there been an impact on Florida's blood supply? Okay. The, um, there has been a major impact. So One Blood is the company that provides most of the blood products uh, in the state of Florida. Um, about a month and a half ago, they instituted universal Zika testing. Um, I think that's a, another great screening tool. Um, and I, it's not uncommon to test for mosquito-borne illnesses. I think I believe they also test for West Nile virus um, as a routine process. And again, with the, this implementation of this system, they, they have not seen uh, that implement uh, that uh, any disruption in the supply. Um, and what they do, if they do find a positive Zika case. Um, uh, in the blood supply is that they uh, immediately quarantine that blood supply, take it out of circulation, uh, and notify the CDC, the FDA, as well as the health department. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Uh, we want to talk a little bit uh, now about uh, the operations uh, uh, for how we're tackling this. Uh, so, Brian, uh, talk a little bit about the uh, surveillance program and how the county monitors the mosquito populations here locally. Sure. Uh, we have a surveillance program that's made up of uh, sentinel chickens. The sentinel chickens are used to test for diseases such as West Nile, St. Louis encephalitis, uh, Eastern Equine encephalitis, and Highlands J. Uh, we have eight coops located around Pinellas County. Uh, each of those coops have seven chickens in them, so 56 chickens altogether. Uh, and what we do is we draw blood from the chickens and we send it to the lab in Tampa and it's tested for these diseases. Um, should that come up positive? then we would enact our actions towards you know, battling that type of disease. Um, another surveillance that we have is we monitor mosquito populations. We have 46 traps that are set out in static uh, areas around the county, uh, meaning that these trap locations never change. Uh, we have data going back for 25, 30 years of mosquito populations. Um, so with these, we can tell if there's upswings in mosquito populations or downswings. Um, and also, we can take these mosquito populations, if we pick up 80s aegypti in these traps, we can send them to be tested as well. Um, as Dr. Cho had talked about, we send pools of uh, aegypti over to a lab in Kissimmee to be tested for Zika virus, and all of those pools have come back negative. Uh, another form of surveillance is actually uh, with the assistance of the health department any um, patients that may come up with the diseases of, of West Nile, Triple E, SLE, or chikungunya, dengue, or Zika, they're all reported to us as suspect cases, and we will you know, send our teams out to address those. Talk a little bit, if you would, about how we tackle the issue, uh, the spraying, the education, um, and uh, the phrase we've heard a lot is boots on the ground into the neighborhood spraying and treat. Just talk a little bit, walk through how we uh, handle that issue. Sure. So what we do is once we're notified of a suspect case, we send a task force team out of uh, three to four employees to canvas a neighborhood. Uh, in regards to Zika, uh, it's these employees going through door to door. Uh, they're looking for opportunities for source reduction. 
Uh, they're looking for areas where they can knock over containers. Um, they hand out pamphlets to educate uh, citizens of, you know, what they can do to, you know, help prevent the, the mosquitoes from breeding. Uh, we'll apply larvicides uh, for areas that you can't dump, uh, such as large bird bats or ponds that may be breeding. Uh, we'll apply larvicides to those. And we also use adulticides um, through the use of handheld foggers and thermal foggers. Thank you, Brian. Uh, Dr. Unash, we've heard uh, some of the treatment, the kind of traditional. Uh, another method that has been getting a lot of discussion is the use of genetically modified mosquitoes. Uh, can you share your thoughts on, on that use and that tool? Um, sure. Uh, genetically modified mosquitoes, uh, the ones that are currently available that uh, for control that have been approved or at least in the pr approval process through the FDA are produced by a company known as Oxitec. And it's actually very similar to a technology that was developed in the 19, late 1940s to eliminate the screw, screw worm from um, the cattle uh, in populations in uh, southern, uh, northern Mexico and southern Texas. At that time, they used the state-of-the-art technology uh, of the time, which was radiation. Uh, they produced mass numbers of screwworm screw larvae and uh, adults and then irradiated them. Uh, with x-ray irradiation to sterilize them. Uh, then they released large numbers of males. The males were sterile. They went out and they mated with the females. Uh, the resulting matings were uh, infertile, and they basically caused the screwworm population to crash and no longer become an agricultural problem along the South Texas coast. Um, the mosquitoes that Oxitec developed are in many ways similar. What they have done is they've engineered the genome so that the mosquito males are completely sterile unless they are provided tetracycline. Um, so they can raise these mosquitoes to large numbers in the laboratory, feeding them uh, just regular mosquito food uh, with a little bit of tetracycline in the, in, the, in the media that they're feeding them as they come up through larva. And then when the adults are, are born, they can separate the males and the females. Um, and then they end up with the males, and they can release those males. And when the males go out into the environment, there's no more tetracycline, uh, and the males become sterile. The males are much better than we are at finding the females, I think you can say. And they act as little guided missiles to go and they find the females. They'll mate with the females. Uh, the females actually have a spermatophore, which holds the sperm and allows them to fertilize the eggs, normally over a long period of time. But um, if the sperm is sterile, that female is effectively sterilized as well. And therefore, by releasing relatively large numbers of male mosquitoes, which do not bite, uh, the only mosquitoes that bite are the females, and that's because they need the protein in the blood to make eggs. Males don't need protein because they're not making eggs, so they feed upon flower nectar and flower sap. Uh, and um, so they're really not harmful to humans. Um, and they'll go out there and they'll find these mosquitoes and they'll eliminate all the females and sterilize the females. And eventually, over a period of uh, three to four months, you can get large reductions in the number of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes that are out there, 90, 95% in the uh, studies that have been done in Grand Cayman Island and down in Brazil. So I think it is a very safe technology because you're basically releasing just sterile Male mosquitoes that don't feed on anything, they're not going to be able to replicate on their own. Uh, it's a dead end, basically, for the mosquito when they're let out, let out of there. We really understand exactly what they are um, and how they've been, uh, <clears throat> you know, constructed. Um, so it's a completely safe technology, I believe. Um, but it does take a relatively long time to have an effect. So um, for doing this for acute control, uh, let's say if you have an outbreak and you really want it to control things, I think it's maybe not an ideal technology. But in terms of as an adjunct uh, technology to be used over the long term to try and target the mosquito populations, for example, when they're down to try and really break the cycle and eliminate the population, I think it has a lot of promise. And the long term impacts, not necessarily on the mosquitoes, but on the environment. Uh, we've heard some questions raised about that. Um, well, this is not like a selective type thing where you're uh, introducing a mos uh, an insecticide resistance gene or anything else. These mosquitoes, once they are uh, adapted and they leave the lab, they're sterile and they're going to die. So um, the effects on the environment are basically minimal to non-existent, in my opinion. Okay. Uh, Brian, um, we heard about the bites. Um, how can citizens uh, protect themselves from the insects? And also, if you'd go and also into what is the, the number one thing residents can do to fight uh, the, the exposure? Sure. So to protect yourself, um, first and foremost is wear long clothing, pants, shirts. 
I know Florida's hot. Sometimes that's not the best alternative to, to wearing uh, long clothing. So uh, what you can do is you can use uh, different repellents, uh, things with deed in it, things with picaridin, uh, oil of eucalyptus. Um, there's also uh, products like uh, Thermacell that will emit a, a odorless and uh, invisible barrier that'll repel the mosquitoes from you. Uh, those are all great choices. Um, one of the key things that citizens want to keep in mind is dump your containers. Go around your homes, look for any items that might be collecting water. Something as small as a bottle cap could breed up to 100 Egypti mosquitoes in it. Uh, if, if anything gets through, that's going to get through. Uh, source reduction is going to be our number one key to controlling Egypti mosquitoes. Okay. That's something we hear uh, over and over again, yet I think it's important to continue to remind, especially after the rain season that we've had, uh, that those water opportunities exist that we need to continue to communicate. Um, I want to go to Mr. Bennett and uh, uh, share with us a little bit how Pinellas County is communicating to the public some of the tips that Brian said as well as other issues with Zika. Absolutely. I think you've heard a lot of it already. Uh, we talked about education, communication, and operations. And in Pinellas County, uh, you know, we have a couple themes that we use constantly. First is all hazard. And when we think of things in an all hazard context, we look at natural events, accidental events, intentional events. And of course, we're kind of in the natural space here. So it's very important to us that we talk to our partners, which include the folks that you see on this panel, as well as our 24 municipalities, our unincorporated partners, everything you can imagine from the school system to the power companies to all the other service providers. Uh, matter of fact, tomorrow we host a response operations call with all of those partners, just like we did for the recent tropical storm. So that's how we constantly communicate inside the county and share. How we do it with the public is very simple. Our marketing communication staff, along with our partners, uh, we make sure we work with our local media affiliates, um, you know, whether it's press or TV, otherwise. We are strong web partners, so we make sure we have things on the web and social media. And then most importantly, we have a system called Alert Pinellas, where you can register. And should we have information that needs to be targeted to your community, we can alert you through that system. And then we've been exploring other social media opportunities for targeted communication, like a program called Next Door, where your neighborhood can sign up as a group and then allow government to come in on emergency basis only, so we don't interrupt your normal community conversations, but we bring emergencies to you right to your doorway, as the, the, the app describes. Um, other things we can do is we can have interactive communication. We have a, um, a process in Pinellas County we call doing things for you, which means we're actually doing things, as you've heard from Brian today, out in the field. And we have a doing things application that you can download. And in that application, we have an opportunity for you to request uh, mosquito review of your property to see what's going on, whether it needs to be sprayed or investigated as that source reduction was explained as part of the prevention. So we have a holistic way to communicate and market our information. And I think we have a much more educated community now and they're more engaged for prevention purposes. Well, and that goes to the point, we've heard other uh, uh, West Nile and encephalitis, we've heard other cases. Uh, the public's reaction to this is obviously a little bit different, a lot more in tune. Uh, can you? You touched a little bit. Can you talk about the internal operations of the county, of how we're coordinating that surveillance, that operations, the treatment, uh, as well with the Department of Health, as well as communicating, how that all is overseen so that we're not in silos and not talking to each other? Sure. I can tell you, Dr. Cho and I almost talked on a, a daily basis at this point. And it's not because there's a lot of activity, but to make sure that we both have shared information from the Department of Health to county government, which they, then again, we get to share in cooperation with our uh, municipal partners and our other service provider partners, as well as the school system. So we're constantly in situational awareness mode, uh, no matter what the hazard might be, but specifically in the Zika case, uh, as we develop our situational awareness inside the county, we actually put that out and make sure that the public understands what we know on the factual level in real time or as in near real time as possible. And as Dr. Cho mentioned earlier, there's some things that require uh, a little bit of an elongated investigation before we can actually share those things. But once we do, it's important that we move it from the internal audience to our public audience. And uh, obviously, uh Tourism is huge for Pinellas County. So uh, talk a little bit, that's why it's, I think it's so important of how we talk about this issue uh, so that it's edu educational, a little bit more technical, 
uh, to where people are informed. Talk a little bit about if you're traveling to Pinellas County, you're traveling to Florida, what should you, what should you know? What should you think about? And I think, you know, before Zika became on the tip of our tongue, as far as awareness went, most people come to a subtropical climate and they protect themselves from mosquitoes to start with. And I think those same protection opportunities exist, whether you're a tourist or a resident, whether you work here, live here, or play here. So I think the community, whether they're traveling or resident, they're wise to the mosquito population and mosquito risk uh, just from the, the simple bite of a mosquito. We haven't seen any effects on tourism from our Convention and Vis Visitors Bureau. The state's doing a great job of keeping us up to date on a statewide process. And of course, um, you know, as travelers come to the Tampa Bay area, specifically Pinellas County, if there was some sort of risk, we would be communicating that. And I think as Dr. Cho mentioned earlier, we don't see a health risk at this time. Thank you, John. Um, I also wanted to mention, since we did talk about tourism, we did have a couple other uh, special guests in the audience. Uh, we have Bill Horn, the city manager of Clearwater. Thank you for being here this morning. Uh, we have Justin Shea with the city of Gulfport. Thank you for being here. And as well as Doug Izzo with the Tampa Bay Beaches Chamber. Appreciate your presence today as well. Uh, Dr. Cho, uh, so we have some questions from the audience and also from our blog. Again, if you have a question today, uh, fill out one of these yellow cards. Uh, we'll try and fit it in in our time this morning. Uh, Dr. Cho, uh, I have a question from Robert. Uh, are, the, are the elderly at higher risk for any neurological complications from the Zika virus? Are the elderly at, at, at higher risk than um, other citizens? Um, I would not say that. Uh, there's no studies to prove, uh, uh, prove that the elderly are at higher risk um, for any neurologic uh, complications at this time. But again, uh, going back to what I said earlier, I, I think it, it, is, it is sort of a new virus that is actually being studied, and we are learning more and more about it each day. Thank you, doctor. Uh, and then, uh, Brian, if you talk uh, about what, uh, what chemicals are used when we do spray and um, uh, what safety measures are being taken when mosquito control goes out and applies that larvicide, talk a little bit about the chemicals, the safety. Uh, I think there's some questions about that. So if you can kind of sure. go in depth a little bit on that for us. <clears throat> sure. So when we talk about spraying, most people think it's a fogging truck running down the street. Uh, we do have fogging trucks. Our handheld foggers, uh, they use adulticides. Uh, we have two uh, pyrethroid-based adulticides that we use. Um, precautions for those are we spray between the hours of 2.30 to 6.30 in the morning. Uh, we did studies years ago on the uh, activity period of mosquitoes. One is uh, early dusk, and then the next one is between those hours of 2.30 and 6.30 in the morning. So to limit the uh, adulticide coming into contact with beneficials such as bees, uh, butterflies, dragonflies, things of that nature, and even citizens, we pick the 2.30 to 6.30 in the morning time frame to fog. Um, other products that we use, uh, we use uh, larvicides, which are a lot more target specific. Uh, they, they react specifically with um, the DNA and the, uh, the pH in mosquitoes to where other insects won't be affected, such as BTI. BTI is a product that is very target specific to just mosquitoes. Thank you. Uh, I think this will probably be for you, Mr. Bennett. Um, had a couple of questions about uh, uh, how locals can fight uh, pest control. I had a question, should local municipalities conduct their own mosquito control? And tie into that, should its citizens uh, use their own local pest control companies as well in, in the fight? No, I think that's a great question. As we mentioned earlier, um, you know, the fact that we partner with 24 municipalities in the county and mosquito control is a county-wide operation. It's important that those municipalities understand how to work with us as a partner, and we will work with their locality to make sure that the prevention tools that are government-driven will come to their door. They do not need to hire on the outside. Well, that's the next question. How do citizens uh, report or request that kind of service? And as mentioned earlier, uh, we have several ways. Of course, you could call Mosquito Control directly, and we have information in the room that you can take with you, and we will provide it uh, you know, through our web crawler or through our web opportunities. Uh, we have our Doing Things For You app, which you can download, and again, there will be a structured data set for reaching Mosquito Control, which you'll get feedback and responsiveness from them on a fairly quickly basis, considering how many calls they do get. They're doing an amazing job in the field. So the responsiveness to the public countywide or a municipality has been going extremely well, and we've had nothing but great compliments. 
Thank you, John. Dr. Cho, uh, talk a little bit again. I think this has come up in some of the questions about uh, what are the symptoms uh, of, of Zika? Uh, you mentioned for most people it's very mild. You might not even know that you, you got it. Talk a little bit about when it gets a little bit more inflamed and what should people be looking for uh, and what that next step of seeking uh, care. Okay. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, it's a pretty mild disease, and just given my infectious disease background, I've been sort of watching this bug, and you probably longer for you, Dr. Unash, for about three or four years, um, and, and I sort of chalked this up as a milder version of a dengue, and then what raised our eyebrows in the medical community, in the scientific community, is in 2015, that, that possible association with um, birth defects. Uh, but again, going back to the, the symptoms, it's uh, generally mild. It, uh, the classic four symptoms are the fevers, rash, joint pain, as well as redness in the eyes. Um, other symptoms include nausea or vomiting, abdominal pain, and um, uh, pain behind the eyes. Uh, and generally, when, when they have 80% uh, of the time, they don't even show symptoms. Um, but when they do show symptoms, it lasts generally about a week. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Uh, we have a question from James in Tampa. Uh, are we seeing pregnant women taking advantage of the testing? Uh, how has the response been on, on that opportunity? Either one. Are we seeing women take pregnant women take advantage of the testing? Okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, so uh, the, per the, um, uh, the governor's directive, uh, we offer uh, free testing uh, um, for all pregnant women, regardless of their travel history. Uh, at our, in, the, in Pinellas, the locations, you can get that testing at our, our clinical sites located in Tarpon Springs, uh, Clearwater, um, Mid-County, um, Pinellas Park, as well as uh, St. Petersburg. Uh, and to date, uh, close to 150 pregnant women have taken advantage of that uh, program. And John, uh, how are we, again, communicating that, making sure that, that uh, people are aware of that, that testing? Sure. And Pinellas County contracts with the Department of Health to make sure all of our citizens, uh, especially including our indigent citizens, have an opportunity to good health care. So we have uh, outreach programs to reach all of our clients in our health care, Pinellas County health care program. And I'm sure in the region, the same thing holds true in the Bay Area with other government-sponsored health care programs. Thank you, John. Uh, we have a question from Representative Ahern. Uh, uh, Dr. Unash, I would assume this is probably for you. Uh, talk a little bit about the migration. Uh, how far can they migrate or move uh, from where they are? Uh, I presume you're talking about the mosquitoes and not the people. Not the pregnant women, <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, actually, this mosquito is a real homebody. Um, many of the mosquitoes that transmit, let's say, West Nile virus, for example, will move up to about uh, two miles. Uh, from where they are actually uh, born and bred. Uh, these guys, if they move 500 feet, it's moving a lot. Um, so they tend to really stay close by where they're actually uh, brought up in, in the bottle cap or in the bromeliad where they actually were hatched. Uh, this has a real advantage, of course, for us for uh, control because um, if you do have an outbreak, it's not an outbreak that's going to spread very far. Um, so you can target the outbreak within two or three square blocks usually and, and get it under control pretty quickly. Okay, excellent. Thank you. A follow-up would be, um, uh, this is kind of probably for maybe all four of you, uh, kind of for the public, where are we on the scale of prevention and spread or eradication of the problem specifically in Pinellas County? Where do you rate our, our uh, response and, and where we're at today? We can start with John, if you like. Sure. I think we're doing well. Um, you know, the fact that we have a, a small number of travel cases, we have one non-traveler's case that's that's been investigated. Uh, you heard Dr. Cho and Department of Health talk about uh, no public health risk. We're not a transmission environment. We're an urbanized county with over a million folks, and we have a lot of visitors. Uh, we, you know, talking to Brian and mosquito control, we have yet to find a mosquito that has Zika in it. I think that's a very positive thing. I think we owe a lot of this to the public for listening and getting educated, listening to the communication, taking action to be preventative. And we're going to continue in local government to make sure that we continue to push that message to make sure we keep this in the prevention mode. Thank you, John. Anyone else want to comment on that? From the public health perspective, I can give a little bit in, in more insight on the investigatory process. Um, it, 
we, we um, for Zika, for as well as any other communicable disease, we have this um, heightened surveillance. Uh, we look for those symptoms. We work with the doctor's offices as well as the hospitals looking for those. And if someone has uh, comes in with a suspected Zika, we uh, our epidemiology unit goes out, does a thorough interview. They get a timeline of where they've been, who they've interacted with during that incubation period of that virus, which is about 14 days. Um, then they uh, put them in a high risk or low risk category uh, do, and do the appropriate testing. A lot of times they go out and draw the bloods themselves and transport them uh, to the public health labs in Tampa. Uh, so with that, with all that going on, uh, we continue to work with our community partners in mosquito control so we don't, uh, and for any suspected case, uh, whether we have any preliminary confirmed results, we let the mosquito control know so that they can do target their mosquito reduction activities, as, as Brian mentioned earlier, uh, before any of that gets back. And then once we have that confirmed case, it's really working with community partners to get that messaging out to the public. Thank you, Dr. Cho. I uh, had a question for Mosquito Control. Uh, do you conduct public education outreach, and how can people get a hold of you if they want to have some public education uh, uh, done? Uh, yes, we do. We actually have an a employee that we hired, Rob Kruger. He is our entomologist and education and support specialist. Um, he does conduct uh, different meetings, and he d gives presentations. He's been out to a number of different city councils, um, HOAs, and um, schools. So if you'd like to contact us, our number is 464-5906. Uh, you can also contact us through the, um, uh, the website um, and just let us know, you know what your organization is and Rob would get back to you and set up the presentation. And that's PinellasCounty.org and there is yeah. a mosquito control button on the front page, I believe, right now. Yes. And if you're in the audience today, at the back of the room, there is a display back there and you can uh, learn more how we do that. Uh, Dr. Cho, again, this is a question that continues to raise up. Uh, are there special steps pregnant women should take to protect themselves? I, th I think more than importantly uh, is is that cover and drain messaging, as, as it's been mentioned here a few times. Uh, and then the, what cover stands for, again, uh, as Brian mentioned, uh, long sleeves, long pants, uh, wearing the mosquito repellents. I would also add, uh, and I think you might have mentioned, the um, um, preventing the uh, mosquitoes from coming into your homes, repair those screen doors and screen windows, um, and, then, and then draining any standing water. I think that's key. Uh, obviously, work clo working closer with the, um, your OB gen uh, to see if uh, you are at risk. Uh, looking for those symptoms of Zika, looking uh, to see if you traveled to those areas of outbreak, I think is key there. Thank you, Dr. Joe. Uh, this might be for uh, John or Brian. Uh, this is from Dave in Dunedin. Uh, storms and drainage are commonplace in the summer. Uh, you've talked about what to do with standing vessels, but what can people do to control mosquito growth within private drainage systems? Uh, I'll take care of that one. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> private drainage systems such as uh, gutters or cisterns, um, you can use BTI, uh, Home Depot sells BTI dunks that you can put in, in these cisterns uh, for clogged gutters. Make sure the gutters are clear, make sure they're flowing. Um, mosquitoes aren't going to lay their eggs in, in water that's flowing. Uh, that's key to, uh, a key note to make sure of. Uh, you know, you can use barrier sprays. Um, they're, they're not as efficient. Uh, but if a mosquito was to lay, uh, land on a barrier spray, it would kill it as an adult. <clears throat> but so those, those are some of the things that, you know, citizens can do. Okay. Thank you, Brian. Uh, here's a, a question. Uh, are there other mosquito-borne illnesses circulating in Pinellas? Um, the question says, is Zika the only one? We know it's not a circulating one right now. But are there other, what, talk about a little bit the other mosquito-borne illnesses that are, uh, are out there. Uh, I'll throw that for whoever wants to take that question. Uh, go ahead. So um, I think Brian mentioned this um, earlier. I, I think uh, 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 that we do look for things that we've occasionally, f uh, that occasionally pops out in terms of local mosquito-borne diseases. Um, uh, West Nile was mentioned, that we look for those, the Eastern equine, uh, St. Louis encephalitis virus, as well as uh, dengue and chikungunya. And really the, the pattern of, of Zika has followed so similar to what chikungunya did. It did the same thing, it came from the Eastern hemisphere to the Western uh, hemisphere with the outbreaks in the Caribbeans, um, the Caribbean, Central and South America. Uh, this occurred just two years ago, actually. Um, and we did have some local cases at that time, uh, but due to public health efforts as well as mosquito, mosquito control activities, we were able to control it. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Are there further questions? And for those that uh, we don't get to today, or you, you, there's still the blog will be open on our website, and you can submit those questions, and we'll do the best to answer those uh, in a timely manner. Uh, 
What are the implications for preconception or inner conception? Should someone become infected prior to becoming pregnant? What's their risk for the child? Uh, so again, some of those long terms. How long uh, is the Zika virus uh, living within the person to where they, their concern uh, should be? How long should that concern be? That's a good question. At the, um so there's uh, guidelines released by the CDC as it pertains to uh, sexual activity as well as pregnancy and, and pre-planning. Um, uh, again, uh, the studies have shown that in bodily fluids, uh, it can uh, last for long periods of time, uh, six months in males and about two months in females. So about that time is what you, you should wait if you have traveled um, to those outbreak regions. Okay. We're good? All right. Any further questions from the audience? All right. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, let each of our panelists have just a, uh, a minute or so. What's the one thing we should walk out of here, or if you're t watching it on the web or on TV, what's the one thing that you want to leave with our citizens? And, and we'll start with Mr. Bennett. Stay tuned. Um, I think it's important. You know, we do a lot of uh, fact sheets. Um, you can find these on our website or the Department of Health website. You, as a family, you can post it on your refrigerator to remind you and your family uh, of the Ds that we talked about, you know, draining things, using DEET, uh, and dressing accordingly. And even now, Brian talked about the dunk. We can add a fourth D to that um, if you have standing water outside that uh, you can't drain. So, you know, stay tuned to the information. I think... Pinellas County and our partners in the region are doing a tremendous job uh, across all levels of government to make sure that you're informed and, and we are being responsive to your needs. Um, and I think as this unfolds, you'll show that prevention will be key um, and we will continue to work internally and externally with the community to make sure that our public, our partners, and even our personnel who are working in the fields um, are as protected as possible. Thank you. Brian? From a mosquito control perspective, uh, we have a million techs out there in Pinellas County that can help us with source reduction. Um, it's as simple as just going around and making sure you pick up all of your containers, uh, treat the things that you can, um, and also a key important point is defend. Dress, defend, and protect yourself. Uh, like Dr. Cho had mentioned, it comes down to making sure that the mosquitoes cannot get into your house um, and making sure that they cannot feed on you. Uh, if you don't give them room and board and, and a meal, they won't hang around. Thank you, Brian. Dr. Cho. Uh, like any other public response, I think for Zika, I think it's all about good partnerships and communications. Uh, and, and I think we do share, share that uh, with the county, with uh, businesses, with the schools. Uh, we, are in the pro we are continuously getting that messaging and education and awareness out there. Um, and what's important is, as Brian mentioned, we would have close to a million more hands uh, on deck if we uh, all practice cover and drain. Uh, so I encourage you to do, do, to do that. And from our standpoint, uh, assurance that we will, uh, the hardworking uh, staff at the Department of Health will continue to um, do the proper appropriate surveillance, uh, testing, and, and um, interventions as needed. Thank you. Dr. Yunash. Um, one thing that I would like to uh, mention uh, is people should not panic over this thing. Um, if one looks at Aedes aegypti, which is the mosquito that's transmitting this, it transmits several other viruses that have been roaring endemics uh, throughout the Caribbean and Mexico and Latin America for years, uh, including dengue virus, chicken gunya virus. Um, if one looks at what's happened with those, they've never really managed to get a foothold here in Florida. And I think the reason for that is uh, a combination of our lifestyle, which is we do not spend a lot of time outside, and when we do, we're in our, our screened lanais or in our air-conditioned cars. And also the fact that this state is blessed with probably the best uh, mosquito control and surveillance um, programs in the country, and probably in the world, I would even say. And uh, the people here in Florida uh, really know what they're doing who are involved in this, and they tend to jump on the problems really fast and really um, control things. And I think um, that we are going to be seeing sporadic cases of this popping up here and there in Florida, um, but I do not think that it's going to ever develop into an epidemic like we saw in Brazil or many other places in the Caribbean, primarily because of the public health experts that we have here and the abilities that they have in combating this thing. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you to our entire panel. If we could give our panel a round of applause. I can tell you I've read a lot about Zika and Zika control in the last weeks, more than I ever wanted to know. Uh, 
but I learned some things this morning, so I appreciate your input, your expertise. Uh, I want to thank our audience for being here this morning. Uh, if, as you leave, there's some display tables with more information. Uh, we also have a survey for you to take if you'd like to let us know how these programs are for you. Uh, we want to again thank Dr. Bright and uh, St. Petersburg College for your hospitality. And uh, thank you very much for being here today. Have a great day.